Hi there, my name is Logan Campbell, and the project I chose to research on for my CAP 400 class would be the future of the European Union after Brexit. A little outline of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about the European Union, uh, when it was formed, and what it is specifically. A uh, little, little bit of background about Brexit, uh, when it occurred, and what it is specifically. The effects of Brexit on the Euro, and kind of the rise and fall of the uh, prices. Uh, EU catching up with the world technologically and how it is failing uh, to take advantage of the market and the technological sector. The rise of the radical right in Europe, specifically after the Greek debt crisis, and the slow growth of the smaller European Union countries. And finally, I'm going to be talking about why, as Americans, we should be caring about this. So, the question I want to be answering uh, with this presentation is, is the European Union sustainable after Brexit? After the United Kingdom left the European Union, it left a large hole financially and also in other aspects. So this presentation is going to be going into the, the hurdles that the European Union has to go through in order to continue to be sustainable and a uh, market model for the rest of the world. As I said before, I'm going to be going into the background of the European Union. The European Union was created just after World War II between the European countries to form a sort of economic alliance. This is where they had free trade and open borders within the other countries and kind of helped those countries um, bounce back after the terrible war that was World War II. The headquarters for the European Union is in Brussels, Belgium, and there are currently 28 countries in the European Union. Uh, this was just after the Brexit, which as we know the UK left, which would have been 29. Uh, Brexit, as I mentioned before, uh, was a vote by the uh, uh, British people to leave the European Union. It was a very narrow victory on the side of Brexit, where 52% of the people, specifically 51.89%, chose to leave the European Union. This occurred on June of 2016, but is not going to be implemented completely until March of 2019. They elected to uh, depart slowly over time to kind of uh, wean themselves off the European Union and to not cause such a complete economic shutdown. As I, as I said before, this is going to be a huge loss for the European Union, mostly because Britain had the second largest GDP of the European Union uh, besides Germany, which was number one. Uh, the European Union together uses the Euro. Uh, but Brexit, or Britain was an exception where they did use the pound, and I'm going to be talking about that in the next slide. I have a few quotes here from the staff reporter uh, from the Olive Press uh, that I will talk about in a little bit. But initially, uh, many people thought that with the uh, choice of exiting the European Union, the euro would have a huge crash and go down significantly. However, that was true, but only for a short time and it then eventually bounced back up. That is a quote from the reporter of all the press. The main effect on the euro over the course of the last year is that it has been worth considerably more against the pound. This means that however the euro did fall a little bit, the pound fell even greater, causing much of the uh, financial toll to go against Britain instead of for it as thought before. Also stated before was the euro was able to buy 113 around the time of the referendum, but now after a low of 104 in December, it is pushing up around 112 mark. What this really means is that the euro's buying power, both against the pound and the dollar, is really more affected by the rise and falls of the currencies in the global markets than the events that trigger them, mainly Brexit and the election of Trump. As I stated before, uh, the pound is taking the, the largest hit here, uh, unlike the euro, which is more being uh, kind of decided by the world market, unlike just the European market, unlike the pound, which is being directly affected from Brexit. This, however, is hurting the EU through trade, since the pound is taking such a direct blow from, the, uh, uh, from, Brex from Brexit. The UK is going to be looking more towards trade and developing their economy inside. Uh, because they're going to have to renegotiate most of their deals with the European Union. This means that the European Union is going to have to look for different areas and different sectors 
to gain back their GDP loss with the UK. A large area open for this would be the tech industry. Uh, the EU, like I said before, needs to find ways to gain what they lost in their GDP with the departure of Brexit. And the technology sector is a large and thriving new sector. Uh, however, the EU is lacking in this sector, far behind China and the US, because the US and China have large single markets. The EU does have a large single market as well, but they have not taken advantage of this. Also, they do not have the right um, education for a large booming technology sector. Uh, 18 of the top 25 uh, universities for technology are in the US, and the US also provides large incentives for companies to move to these areas where they have an influx of new minds and young students. In order to have a large and booming technology sector, uh, the EU needs to also uh, provide more incentives like the US. The next problem that the EU faces in the future would be the rise of the radical right. After the Greek debt crisis, um, the far right parties came out of hiding and became more influential in the areas uh, they uh, had been founded. They are a strong nationalist party and a common saying for them is country first, Europe second. They are very anti-EU and would want nothing more than to leave the European Union. Two of the largest parties in the EU for the far right are the National Front, which is in France, directed by Marine Le Pen, and the Freedom Party in Austria, which is directed by Sebastian Kurz. Uh, these parties are also anti-immigration, and because of that, they have been gaining a strong foothold in many of the countries that have seen an influx of Syrian refugees, specifically in Austria and France. Uh, Austria, Sebastian Kurz just won the uh, the election to be chancellor, and Marine Le Pen came in second to be the French president. As I mentioned before, these are going to be huge threats for the EU in the future, and to combat these, the EU needs to um, specifically target on the lower income areas, which is where they have the strongest foothold. Which leads me to my next topic, the slow growth in the smaller countries. As you notice in the graph over here, a large portion of the EU's GDP is from the big five. Uh, Germany, France, UK, which is no longer there, Italy, and Spain. All of these smaller countries, however, have a lot smaller GDPs, have larger rates of unemployment, and have less currency being circulated throughout their economy. As mentioned before, they have this large rate of unemployment, and the far-right parties are very much an influence in here. To fix this, the EU has been considering to increase trade and focus inward on the smaller countries, but according to uh, Giles Merritt in his book Slippery Slope that I read before this, uh, that isn't helpful and we should more focus on globalization. Uh, the message that all these experts are sending is that Europe must play a much more influential role in world affairs to maintain the living standards of the citizens, the EU must first maintain international stability. He compares this to the uh, United States just after World War II, uh, where we implemented the Marshall Plan, where we, we, where we were very far-sighted and selfless, uh, which is what the European Union should do as well. And by helping others through globalization, they'll indirectly be helping themselves in the future. So my last topic is going to be, why should us as Americans care? This is happening over in Europe, which is thousands of miles away. So how does this affect us? Well, the European Union as a whole is the largest trading partner of the U.S. with $6.5 million in trade in 2017. So therefore, if the EU collapsed, it would lead to another collapse in the USA, just kind of like our recession in 2008 caused a recession over there, and the Great Depression caused a depression over in Europe also. And if the EU were to, were to fall, we would have to renegotiate all of our deals. Uh, these trade deals would take time and money and would just be a huge huge, uh, uh, a huge kind of hurdle that the U.S. would have to go through, which would cost millions and millions of dollars. Another reason why we should care would be Russia. Russia has been on the news lately for no, no good reasons, and it's because they've been trying to get their stronghold back into Eastern Europe. Uh, that's with annexing Crimea and annexing Georgia in Southeastern Europe. If the EU were to crumble, 
This would leave a huge gaping hole for Russia to step in and take charge. Also, smaller countries would start wars of resources. Because the EU is um, an economic alliance, they're able to trade resources that they might not have within their country. With the collapse of the EU, this would send many small countries into wars for resources, and the U.S. would inevitably have to step in. My final conclusion, um, throughout the research that I've done on this topic, I believe that the European Union right now is not in a good place to continue into the future. Uh, there's many steps that are going to have to be taken, and uh, there are steps that are readily available for them, and very possible steps. But if they change these steps, they will be able to continue in the future and possibly be a new uh, uh, foundation for a global government yet to come. Thank you.